Good afternoon, everyone. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you and your loved ones are healthy and safe. My name is Randy Bell, and I'm the director of the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council. Thank you all for joining us for our Energy Source Innovation Stream, where we aim to highlight new energy technologies with the potential to reshape the global energy system through discussions with companies and individuals working diligently to bring those innovations to market at scale. Today, we will be hearing from Dave Copps, the CEO and co-founder of Worlds, on how artificial intelligence can unlock a new era of abundance through the acceleration of intelligent automation. Before we get started, two administrative details. First, you can follow us on Twitter at AC Global Energy and use the hashtag innovation stream. Second, after Dave's presentation, you can submit questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. And I'll try to get to as many of these questions as I can. If you're watching on another platform like YouTube, unfortunately, we cannot take your questions. So please let me welcome Dave Copps to the Atlanta Council. Dave, uh, how are you holding up during the quarantine? <laughs> I think as good as anyone. Um, you know, uh, we have the, both kids at home now, which I think uh, I had a friend tell me that uh, his kids make terrible roommates. So I think <laughs> that's probably right. <laughs> it's, uh, but it's been good. It's been nice to have the family time. And then uh, I don't know about everybody else, but uh, I think I'm actually more productive when I'm not having to travel and move around so much. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been interesting to say the least. Well, at, at the end of this, we're going to talk uh, about something outside the energy space that we're glad you're being productive, uh, productively working on. Uh, for, for everybody, um, my, my three-month-old is asleep in the room below me. And so <laughs> up in the middle of this, if I'm not on mute, you might hear some crying. Uh, so uh, I, hope you, I hope that's okay. Um, Dave, why don't, we, why don't we get started with your presentation? And uh, for those uh, watching, uh, Dave will give a 10 to 15-minute presentation, and then we'll go into Q&A. So Dave, over to you to share your screen. Fantastic, okay. All right. Great. Can everybody see my screen? Awesome, okay. Well, thanks for joining everybody. I'll uh, assume that everyone's at home and uh, this talk can maybe provide a nice uh, break in your day. Uh, I don't know about you, but with Dave, I'm sorry, we're, we're not able to see your screen. Huh, hang on. How about now? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thanks for joining everybody. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, all the video conferencing, I think I've never met so many people from the waist up. Uh, it's, it's been an interesting time, but uh, thank you for joining today. Uh, I'll go ahead and get started. These, uh, it's a pretty short presentation, so I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, yeah, a little bit about me. I'm a serial entrepreneur. My name is Dave Copps. I've spent my entire career, career really building companies that have foundation in AI and machine learning. Uh, I was actually an anthropology major in college, much to the dismay of my mother. Uh, but I've always been a curious technologist in AI, is something I've been had a passion for my whole career. Um, through, my, through my companies, I've placed uh, AI and machine learning in hundreds of companies around the world. Um, and I'm currently CEO of a company called Worlds out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, we have a platform that enables uh, machines to see and sense the world like we do, uh, kind of magnifying human perception, if you will. Uh, and I've been uh, fortunate to have some success in the, the industry over the years. Um, my wife says I'm unemployable. I think that's probably why I start companies. <laughs> but she's probably right. Um, so, you know, it's interesting because um, when I signed up to do this talk, it was before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so the last several days, it seemed like a strange time to give a talk about abundance. But uh, the more I thought about it, the more I actually realized it's, it's not uh, because the, the tools and the technologies uh, that uh, we're all powering the pre-COVID-19 abundance are the same ones that will get us out of the crisis. Uh, so I think there's maybe talk like this is even more relevant now than it was several weeks ago. Um, it's hard not to watch the news and adopt the dystopian view of AI. Uh, <laughs> I think we see a lot of stories and it's always is the future about us or about technology and I think that's kind of a false choice. It's not about us or technology. There's no reason we can't have both. Um, so we're gonna talk about that today. Uh, people empowered by AI solving problems like we've never had before. Um, so in terms of change, uh, the next 10 years will equal the last 100 years. Uh, and more importantly, the way that we work over the next 15 years will change more than it has over the last 2000 years as we kind of co-evolve with AI, it becomes more integrated part of all of our lives and our businesses. Um, you know, the first question I get asked most of the time when I talk to people is about jobs. Um, some of you may have seen this, this headline, uh, the New York Times, President ranks automation versus job challenge, he cites the 
burden of finding work for those displaced by machines. Well, if you have seen it, you're more than 50 years old because that's actually from 1962 and it was response to something that President Kennedy said. Um, so this is not a new thing. Uh, we've been here before. Uh, we can't let fear of displacement slow us down. It's, it's time to embrace uh, AI and the emerging technologies that are with us today. So why now? Why is this happening now? Um, well, first of all, after two AI winters where the promise of the technology actually exceeded the results, we're all set for a persistent acceleration of AI. Uh, in my opinion, no more AI winters. I think uh, the foundation is set and uh, more specifically, that includes accelerated hardware. So thanks to companies like NVIDIA and Intel and ARM, we're able to process information a thousand times faster than previous processors. Uh, it's, it, it, uh, you know, with uh, data, uh, <laughs> it used to be that we had too much data and, and it, if you had too much data, it was a liability. But today, uh, because of the learning opportunities with AI and the ability to store it cheaply, we can't get enough of data. We can't get enough data. So, um, uh, and then probably most importantly, uh, it, I believe is the, um, the, ex the acceleration of software. So deep learning, reinforcement learning, uh, generative adversarial networks. Um, we're experiencing a new revolution in the machine's ability to learn. And so I want to look at those a little bit deeply. Let's look at each of these areas just a little uh, more deeply. So um, because of the advances in hardware, something really incredible is happening. Well, we're not bending time. Um, we're absolutely transforming what's possible in time. You know, with over 32 billion transistors on a chip today, um, we're able to now have calculations per second over 200 quadrillion. <laughs> uh, Think about that. You know, if, if every person on Earth, to kind of put it in perspective, if every person on Earth completed one calculation per second, uh, it would take 330 days to do what this Department of Energy Summit supercomputer can do in one second. Um, so hardware is, uh, it continues to, to get better and better. We now have specialized chip companies coming out building chips specifically for AI. Um, and it's uh, in Intel and in, uh, NVIDIA are getting involved as well. So let's look at data. Um, so there's 25 billion connected devices in the world today. Um, there's a, there'll be a hundred billion connected, uh, by 2024. Um, today there's, by the end of this year, they're saying there'll be 3.5 billion cellular IOT connections by the end of this year. Um, so we're really, we're heading towards a trillion sensor economy. So we are approaching a time uh, where everything we touch will be intelligent and connected. So the opportunity for the energy industry uh, to, to remotely sense and optimize their environments has never been greater. Um, in terms of data, you know, I saw a stat the other day that more data was created this year than in the past 5,000 years. Um, but you don't hear about uh, how do we store all this data anymore. You don't hear that anymore. Uh, this, so the more data, the better when it comes to AI. Um, I think the most amazing thing though in this whole evolution is the software. Uh, maybe I'm biased because I'm a software guy and an AI guy. But, um, you know, we start back in time uh, in 1952, Bernie the Brain could beat a human. <laughs> they had about 255,000 move, possible moves in tic-tac-toe. Um, of course, in 1997, we all heard about uh, Kasparov and there were 121 million possible moves there. Um, then it gets really interesting, right? So now with uh, Google's AlphaGo, I'm sure most of you or some of you have heard about this, but um, there's a game called Go, uh, which is the most complex board game in the world. And it has... Uh, over uh, has more possible moves than there are atoms in the universe to give you an idea of the complexity. Um, so Google's AlphaGo beat Lisa Dahl, the world's greatest Go player. But the real departure here, and the thing that's important for us all to realize is that um, rather than learning from data, what happened was it played itself in the game for four hours. Um, so think about that, four hours of gameplay learning in AlphaGo exceeded 1500 years of human knowledge. Um, it's, a, it's a phenomenal thing when you think about it. Has anyone seen the, uh, raise your hand if you've seen the, the movie War Games with Matthew Broderick several years ago. Anybody seen that? Um, remember in the end of the game where uh, the Whopper was the computer, I think, W-O-P-R, and, uh, and uh, at the end of the game, it played itself in the game of thermonuclear war and it stopped and said, the only way to win is not to play. You know, learn by, simulating war and uh, that's really what's happening here today now. We have technology that does not require data to learn, uh, a data set to learn. You can actually learn on the fly uh, from experience. So uh, very, very impressive. 
Um, so we really evolved from things uh, where technology has been obedient, static, and logic-based, I mean, command-based to automated, dynamic, and intuitive. <laughs> so in a, it's, in a way, it's AI is becoming a lot less like data and a, a lot more like curve. <laughs> um, so uh, actually, let me do a poll real quick. Uh, uh, how many of you uh, are within three feet of your cell phone right now? Raise your hand. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's interesting. We, we, we learn from uh, Google. We, uh, we learn where to go with maps. Um, we're all pretty much, you know, a little ways. Uh, we're augmented our, by AI today. We're all augmented cyborgs. <laughs> but that's important because uh, to realize that, that that distance is going to get shorter and shorter between us and the technology and the AI because we're limited by our biology. Um, you know, um, our brains process information at about 60 bits a second, where AI processes information at a trillion bits a second. Um, to make matters worse, our recall is about 65 or 70% of what we learn. On Saturday night, it may be 50%. Uh, AI, on the other hand, uh, recalls 100%. So it's important that we continue to, uh, to um, uh, our interactions and become more intimate with AI and help to augment our abilities through AI. Um, so what's next for energy? Um, I think one of the most powerful manifestations of artificial intelligence that's happening today occurs when organizations choose to sense their worlds through the lens of AI. Um, so by combining AI and sensor networks, some um, energy companies can extract and analyze data from the real world in the way that large tech companies extract data from the virtual world. So the result is kind of a radical improvement in how we can quantify and predict and optimize the real world. Um, so dark environments, uh, remote environments that uh, we have today, the ones that are not being fully sensed, can all be lit up, connected, optimized, quantifiable, and smart. So it's uh, presenting nothing less than a new ability for a new world. Um, so the problems we're solving, uh, we'll talk a little bit about our work at Worlds. Um, so the problem we're solving, you've probably seen these, drawing boxes on screens, and people are teaching AI to learn things. and. Uh, security systems, we have cameras, multiple cameras on a screen, and then multiple screens with multiple cameras on screens, and that just really doesn't work. You know, it's a, it's a reactive system. It doesn't do anything that's state-of-the-art as you wait for something to break and go wrong and you go check it out. Um, we think there's a better way. So um, essentially what we're doing is taking a solution where we're combining three things. So uh, we're combining AI, uh, deep learning AI, uh, with sensor networks. So it could be cameras initially, but we're also working with uh, some very exciting sensors that we'll talk about later. Um, but, and then we, we take the information from those centers and we, we sent, we optimize those and have those viewable inside, we express those inside of a 4D model, literally a model, like a game, like a video game. So by combining the deep learning and IOT inside the model, we're creating, uh, a very, uh, environment where everything is measurable in space and time. So with the ability to measure physical objects, we can now engage AI's help in how to optimize those environments. Um, so our solutions, so we've got a, a 4D interface. So you have a, a 4D interface where it becomes kind of a home base for IoT. All sensors can be deployed inside the environment and you can actually not just see this information from the sensor, but understand what's happening when and where. Um, we'll show you some telepresence capabilities here in a second where you can actually fly around the models like you're in a drone. Um, story event detection, where we can actually uh, start to um, uh, give you the ability to understand AI, the ability to understand when things are happening critical events are happening that need to be addressed. Um, and then we have an accelerated learning model. Um, but uh, there's a training model, uh, a bot layer that layers on top. So we can have an AI that actually starts to un uh, look at the model and learn from it and help you do things, uh, make environments safer and more productive. Um, for your presence, I'll show you here in just a moment. And spatial navigation, I'll show you here in just a moment. Um, so. Nothing like to tell the story like a real demo. So I thought, let me take you inside and show you what we have here. So we call this kind of our, uh, it's kind of a god, a god view, if you will. Uh, so it's a, you can actually have all your locations, whether they're in the country, a state, or all over the world, and they can be viewed from a single interface. Uh, and from this view, you can actually kind of go down and, and view what's happening in certain areas or remote observation capabilities. So, um, in this case, uh, we're flying down into Dallas. We're in the, uh, to Ross Avenue and Market Street. Some of you know Dallas pretty well. Um, so this is a model where we have, um, uh, I'll stop it here for a second. What we've done is we've uh, actually reconstructed the, the, the intersection, the buildings, and we have cameras placed on all four corners, as well as we have uh, cameras inside the second floor of the building in the upper left there. 
So when you have cameras inside of a building, you can actually see through the walls because we actually replaced the video uh, with 3D models. So now we can actually see through the walls where we have, uh, uh, we have cameras inside the building. So some interesting capabilities take place. You can see what's happening. The red cylinders are people, the blue cylinders are cars. But we can also go into the, the building where we have cameras so from a remote, and this could be anywhere in the world. You can go in there. Here we have uh, two of our interns walking around. You'll see the kind of dark room milky on the right. Uh, that, that's into the wall. If you look to the far right, you'll see some people behind the wall. Anywhere there's cameras gives you the ability to kind of see behind those walls. So it's a, this, you got the powers for remote observation are, are spectacular. Um, and that's, that can only happen because you have it in a model. So also these, these problems of occlusion where you can't see behind something. We have a camera there in the model, we can see through that wall or through that container on a rig or through those things so that accidents don't happen. Um, next thing I'll show you is actually, uh, this is uh, Capital Factory. So um, this is down in Austin, Texas. Uh, we created the, took the BIM file from their architecture drawings and just very quickly created a a model of their building. Um, so you can see it here. Uh, it's the 16th floor of the Capitol factory. Um, to show you the model real quick, yeah, with the fifth and the 16th floor we have, we have about uh, 16 cameras in there. Um, so when you click on the model, you can actually see the picture in picture. There's a view of what's uh, being viewed in the model. Uh, there's the kitchen area. Uh, and then uh, there's the uh, elevator deck right there. Um, and so, uh, we play a video here. Now this is this would be a seven second delay. I obviously don't want to go live for this because you know in the capital factor right now. But uh, in a seven second delay, we actually can replay inside the model what's happening in real life. So if you think about it, there's some very interesting capabilities here. If I uh, we, uh, let it go here, um, this is the ele elevator bank. And so you can see people kind of coming in and out. Uh, and the delay is just very, very minimal. Um, but uh, it gives you the ability to actually place people in space and time. When you look at that video in a, in a, in a CRT screen, you can't tell where someone is really. So um, here, you could actually start to create zones inside of a building or on a rig, where if I created this zone here and said, uh, I only need people here that are wearing a white hat. You know, uh, The AI can look for that and understand if a person is wearing a white hat they're in that zone. You know, So, so you can have AIs kind of become these uh, eyes and ears for you and create uh, safety bots, if you will, and place create security bots, you know, so you can have bots looking for events and things that happen inside the model and alert you when those things, when those things are happening. Um, so the last thing I'll show you, just kind of an interesting demo here, um, is, uh, cause I think I'm running out of time, is this, just real quickly, the, these are glasses of water. The blue glasses uh, are full and the yellow glass is empty. We taught an AI to understand the state of this object, which glass is full, which glass is empty, you know. So in this case, uh, again, the, the blue the blue ones are uh, full, the yellow is empty. So we have uh, one of our guys come in and pick up one of the blue glasses uh, and start to uh, take some water out of it. So they take some water out of it, put the glass back down. Now the AI realizes that that glass is now more empty than full. Uh, then we can take the full glass on the left and pour it into the glass on the right. And now the AI has learned that that glass is full at this point right now. So the reason I showed you that is that there's some very interesting things you can do with AI that a lot of people don't think about. That's virtual sensors. If I have a, a bank of, of uh, 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 gauges, I can actually point an, uh, an AI, a camera at those gauges and teach it. If this gauge is this way, this one's that way, it's bad. Alert somebody, you know, things like that. So I can teach an AI to understand the state of objects. Uh, this truck is full, this truck is empty. You know, uh, we can teach AI to understand the state of objects. Um, so uh, summary, just, uh, you know, I think it's, there's never been a better time for the energy industry to embrace AI-based automation, uh, whether it's remote observation or improving safety or radically optimizing operations. Uh, the pieces are in place now for an age of abundance in energy. Um, yeah, at this point, I'll just uh, end there. Um, a couple minutes over, uh, but uh, turn it over for questions. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, very much. Uh, um, so, again, if you're in the audience, if you can. Uh, Starting my video. Uh, uh, calling in. First, uh, you mentioned that. Uh,
humans only have a 5% retention rate, uh, 50% on Saturday night. So, uh, you're, fr night. you're freezing on me. I, I heard a part of that. Let's see. Yeah, you're frozen, Randy. Uh, maybe uh, you could type a question in the chat or. Um, I hear you now. There you go. Uh, I think you're frozen again. <laughs> um, of, uh, yeah, I think uh, Randy's frozen. We'll have to ask uh, someone to step in. Anyone? Hi, everyone. Uh, Randy, let me know when you're back on. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for this great presentation. Sure. Really appreciate it. Uh, let's talk more about the energy angle when it comes to AI potential. Can you talk about some exciting developments there? What are you mostly looking forward to in terms of expanding in the energy sector and where are the biggest opportunities? Thanks. And I encourage everyone else to type in your questions in the Q&A. Thank you all. Yeah, I think uh, the most exciting thing is this idea, you know, tech companies for years have been uh, measuring their virtual world through data. And uh, now with the uh, uh, advent of IoT and now the ability to understand what's being seen by sensors uh, with AI, um, we've got the ability now in the energy industry to fully understand, fully see uh, and analyze what's happening in real world places, whether it's an offshore rig or a, uh, a well site or a, a refinery. Um, we can now start to create abilities that were never possible before. So, for instance, we're working right now, with, uh, we're, uh, we have some investors, uh, Chevron and Petronas, uh, and some of the projects we're working on involve safety and security, for example. Uh, so with uh, safety, you know, uh, if, you have a, if you have a rig where a person in a white hat is not supposed to be in a certain area, we can train an AI to watch and make sure that if a person in a wrong color hat's in a zone they shouldn't be in, that it can do something. So with every AI that's detecting something, you can say, if this, then that. So if a person in a white hat approaches, it approaches this zone, then sound an alarm, call a supervisor, buzz their phone, you know, things like that. Um, you can actually set up lots of these bots, if you will. So you could have five security bots. Almost think of them like virtual employees that, uh, that don't have uh, uh, time off or uh, text. <laughs> you know, you have several bots that play together to create safe environments or several bots that play together to create a secure and more secure environment. And then the end result is we're going to start to understand uh, how the best facilities are working and how they're optimized where other facilities are not. And we'll be able to model that now and make and create efficiency gains that are just incredible. You know, so it's truly a, a new world for energy. And I think a lot of people could have been burned by IoT in the past. Um, but uh, now it's a different story with AI. Uh, AI is bringing meaning to the whole IoT world. I'm back. My, I, I was back. It's now telling my inter internet is connect connections unstable again. My, uh, I think it's let me same. ask my question, uh, which is, um, what are the weaknesses of AI? You talked a lot about the. Mm -hmm. uh, I got enough of, I got enough of the question. I think to get it. Um, weaknesses of AI. Um, I think you know that it's. Uh, some of them are being overcome now, but in the past, the weaknesses have all been around. Um, it's cumbersome, you know, like to, to actually have a system that can learn um, from, a, from text and I mean, I'm sorry, from video or images, it took too much data and took too much time, and too much processing power. And so it really wasn't an effective way of doing things. Um, and there have been breakthroughs on all of those things now because between um, the increases in hardware and the uh, further optimization of the software, those things are starting to go away. Now there still are the challenges, right? Of do you uh, have AI on the edge or do you have it in the cloud? And uh, I like to tell people that it's not like there's gonna be one of those is gonna become a winner or a loser. We're gonna, AI in the, at the edge is gonna get better and better with these new processes that are coming out. And we're gonna have better and better connection uh, for cloud uh, with 5G and other technologies. Uh, so both of those are gonna get better simultaneously. 
So I think some of the limitations and the problems with AI of the cumbersome learning, uh, they're not going to be there anymore. Uh, we're at a point now where there's, there's breakthroughs in those areas. I'd say one of the weaknesses is it's hard to find people. Um, it's very hard to find people. Of course, we have done a very good job in our country of uh, incentivizing uh, the people to put out those types of employees. But um, that may be the biggest thing right now is just getting people. I think you're still frozen, Randy. <laughs> I've turned my... Uh, helping resolve the uh, the coronavirus crisis. Yeah, um, I can say a little bit about that. Um, you know, when this happened, uh, we already been to work, been at work uh, identifying and working with chemical sensors. So we're uh, working with a uh, sensor uh, that enables us, so before corona, we we're looking at, you know, we could smell a gas a quarter mile away and things like that. And uh, having these, uh, this uh, uh, chemical detection uh, and the thought occurred to us, well, you know, can you smell uh, disease? Because um, I read some stories online where, you know, when people breathe, they're sick. And you've probably seen that. They, it smells different, right? Um, so uh, there's reasons for that. Uh, you produce, your body produces uh, volatile organic compounds uh, when you're sick. And so it's possible to create a sensor that could help non-invasively uh, uh, to sense when someone might have an infection. Uh, we're working on that right now. And uh, we actually have a, a great sponsorship from the government. Uh, they're helping us uh, to accelerate all this development, but uh, the, the idea is to, to create a passive non-invasive sensor that doesn't involve sticking something up your nose or pricking your finger for blood. That could be put, any, put everywhere uh, to make sure that we have uh, safer environments, safer working environments. One note. I think you're still cutting out. <laughs> Uh, My internet. Yeah, I think someone will also have to take over. You just, uh, it's not going to. All right. Uh, Randy might be able to come back here in a second. Uh, so let's talk about the connection between security and AI. I know we also have a question from Branco. Thank you so much. You're talking about using DOS 65 carriers and who are ill and being able to utilize AI to address coronavirus. But also, let's let's talk about the bridge between AI and energy security. Is there a connection? Is there a way to utilize AI to improve energy security, to assess potential threats? Um, mm -hmm. What are the opportunities there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, as everyone on this call knows, uh, when accidents happen, it's usually because some process wasn't followed. Um, and it's just, we're human, it happens. People don't do things, people skip the process, safety processes, something like that creates a, a higher risk environment. So by utilizing AI, um, we can actually start to do things like um, create a control set. Here's what it looks like when someone runs a safety check on a certain uh, facility. Um, and here's what actually happened. So they went here first and spent 20 seconds and went here, but they really, someone did it right, they probably had to spend five minutes there. So you can actually start to have the AI uh, start to tell you when processes and safety procedures are not being followed. So, um, you know, it's, that's 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 a, a very big thing um, and then safety you know um, obviously even on on site you know so uh, we've talked about the problems of occlusion you know so sometimes you know some people get dropped on someone because they did they were occluded they were behind behind something and the, the crane operator couldn't see them you know um, by using the technology that I showed you today we have cameras in the environment that person who's in the crane operator could actually have kind of superpowers and see through that container and see the person behind it, you know? And so we create a, just a completely different environment. So by taking the real world and putting it inside of a 3D model in space and time, we now have the ability to study and optimize everything uh, uh, in space and time. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge jump for, uh, for the industry. Randy, are you able to dial back in? Yeah, All right. It can't. Is this work?
And maybe just chatting the questions would be there. Uh, Olga, Olga, why don't you wrap it up? Because yeah, we're out of time. Sounds great. Thanks, Randy. Dave, thank you so much. This was mm -hmm. enlightening. Uh, I encourage everyone to follow Dave on Twitter at I am Davo and Worlds at Worlds HQ for the latest updates and news. Uh, please make sure to tune in for our next innovation stream, which is happening next Friday at 1.30 p.m. We have Bonnie Norman, who is the president of E3 International. And I also encourage you to join us for our Earth Day event on April 22nd at 11 a.m. where we talk about beyond carbon emissions, collective solutions to environmental challenges. Uh, this presentation will also be available on the Planning Council website, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So there's a way to access it in case you missed it. Thank you all so much, and we apologize for the technical difficulties. Thank you so Thank much, you, Dave. Really appreciate yeah. it. Sure.